Okay. Hi. It's a real pleasure to be here. I can't see the screen. Oh, well. Right. Real pleasure to be here. Um, I can walk, but I need to click. Does this click? Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about donuts. And, yeah, you might ask, why am I using something so small and silly as a donut to talk about something so immense and important as a new paradigm for human prosperity? Um, and I hope that will become clear. I'm also going to tell you a bit of a personal story because I think for whatever reason any of us are here, it's actually always a personal story. And the way we understand the world and the way we see worldviews and paradigms is always a personal story. So here's a little bit of my personal story about that. 25 years ago, I studied economics at university. I studied mainstream economics and then I studied a master's degree in development economics. And this diagram is probably the core diagram at the heart of macroeconomics. So it's households and firms in a circular flow of income and of goods. So households give facts of production to firms like their labor, their land, their capital. In return, they get wages, rent, and dividends. And with that money, they spend it and buy stuff. So the money goes round and round, and the goods go round and round. Now, of course, it's complete nonsense. The economy isn't floating on a white background. This diagram makes absolutely no recognition of the materials and the energy that come from the biosphere and is sucked into the economy and transformed and all the waste and the waste energy that's spewed out and its after effects that go out somewhere totally ignored in this diagram. Economics calls them externalities and you can deal with them on the side in a paper if you want. It also makes absolutely no recognition of where labor comes from, all the extraordinary unpaid caring work that's done by particularly women, but all parents, washing, cooking, cleaning, raising children, getting the homework done, that produces that labor fresh and ready for work every day, all completely unpaid, but absolutely fundamental to human well-being, which is why some people call it the core economy. So I found this diagram extremely frustrating. And I didn't want to call myself an economist. In fact, I never did. And I walked away from economics and left behind all of its diagrams. And I decided to immerse myself in the real world of challenges. So I spent three years working in Zanzibar, in the villages of Zanzibar, with micro-entrepreneurs, particularly with women who were working and raising their families with nothing but the forest resources around them, their community, and their wits. I spent four years working at the United Nations on the Human Development Report, looking for new metrics and ways and paradigms of measure, measuring what human development means. I spent a decade working for Oxfam, particularly campaigning for social justice in response to climate change. And I became a mother of twins. And so I immersed myself in that extraordinary unpaid care economy, and I understood gender in a way that I never had before. So why am I telling you all these stories? Not just to prove that every career is a story of a series of bad haircuts, but also <laughs> because what we experience tells us a view of the world, and it makes us see the world differently. And of course, what I realized that I thought I'd walked away from economics, but of course you can't, because all of this is economics. And economics is, has become the mother tongue of public policy. It's the frame that dominates us. No matter what you study, you know that the frame that public policy is made in is the economic one. When I came back from maternity leave in 2010, I said to a colleague, so, you know, what have I missed? I've been out for a year. And somebody was flicking through a PowerPoint presentation showing me sort of, you know, killer facts from the previous year. And one of the slides was this. And I just had this rush of adrenaline. Before I completely knew what I was looking at, I knew I was looking at something that, to me, was really important. And what I saw in that diagram, having not really studied science beyond O-level at school, what I saw was natural scientists saying to economists, look, if you won't draw a picture of the macroeconomy and place it inside a larger bubble and call that the environment or the biosphere, well, we're going to do it for you. And we've done it, actually. And by the way, we haven't done it in your metrics of money. We've done it in our metrics, our natural metrics. Parts per million, carbon dioxide, or tons of uh, nitrogen fertilizer use, or extent of land use change. So you're going to have to learn to speak in somebody else's metrics now. 
So I found this incredibly exciting. It was a really powerful rebalancing between the disciplines from that powerful frame of economics, which is the language of public policy and everything's got to be monetized if you want it to count, to suddenly, actually, you need to engage with natural science and it's brought a bigger frame. So I was sitting in Oxfam at the time thinking, wow, that's a really powerful re-engagement and rebalancing. Here's me in a social justice organization. If that's what natural science is saying to bring in the environmental reigning in of economics, what can we from an inside and social justice perspective do? And I s focused on that green space inside of the center of that diagram, which has been labeled the safe operating space for humanity. And I tried to think, well, that center of the circle is the idea is it's the, the pre-industrial levels of pressure on all of these systems. And I thought of the women I knew in the villages of Zanzibar or the people in Sahel who were in the middle of a food crisis in East Africa. Uh, my colleagues were digging wells across the world. They were feeding, sending emergency food aid across the world. We were responding to climate change. And I thought, if we went back to the center of that circle, is that really a safe place for 7 billion, soon to be 10 billion people? Can we really go back to pre-industrial levels of land change, of, of water withdrawals, of nitrogen use, and, and that would be fine for everybody. And I began to wonder whether actually, just as these nine boundaries demark an outer, an environmental ceiling, an outer ring, beyond which lies unacceptable environmental degradation, so too I thought, well, surely there's a, a complementary inner social ring, which I drew in, and said, so too there's an inner ring of resource engagement or resource use, below which lies unacceptable human deprivation. So if we don't withdraw enough water or transform enough land, then there won't be enough food for everybody. And I started trying to imagine, actually, it's not this circle that's a safe operating space for humanity, it's a donut. It wasn't me who called it the donut, by the way, it was Tim Linton, who many of you may know. Uh, first time he saw it, he said, oh, it's not a circle, it's a donut. And then the, the deed was done. Uh, these 11 dimensions I crowdsourced from the world's government. So this was in uh, 2011 I drew this. It was in the run-up to the Rio Plus 20 conference in, uh, in Rio, where the world's governments first set themselves the task of creating the Sustainable Development Goals. And in, in that conference, every government was invited to submit a report about what it wanted to be talked about. So I went through every single report and picked out every single social issue that was mentioned and then looked for the ones that were mentioned by over half of the world's governments. And it was these 11, which was incredibly powerful because when I was then invited to present this at the General Assembly in New York, and they might say, is this a Western idea? And I said, no, no, these are your priorities. This is what came out of your documents. So these are your values, your social priorities. So these are the 11 social dimensions I put in. And of course, since 1948, we've been talking about them. Many of them are recognized as human rights. And we know what we think is a minimum standard of food, um, of education, uh, of political voice, of income, you know, $1.25 a day. Everybody's got to go to primary school. You've got to have enough calories to be considered nourished. So we've actually got metrics for these. And so I can very quickly start putting those metrics together. You can see here that we've got the environmental story on the outside and the social story on the inside, but of course the whole thing is a human agenda because these nine planetary boundaries, as we know, have been framed around keeping the Earth in a Holocene-like condition that is so conducive for, for humanity. So in fact, these are you could say they're the dual conditions that underpin human well-being. We need both of these for our human well-being. It's not an environmental agenda, it's a deeply human one. And even though you've got the environmental on the outside and the social on the inside, the really interesting story is the way they interact. So any systems thinker or any, anybody, any visual thinker among you, I hope you're itching to get out your pencil and start drawing in the arrows of how these things interconnect. If I did actually draw them on top, of course, it would look like a bowl of spaghetti. But so I leave, you, leave your imagination to add the spaghetti, but you can see how those relationships would be there. And just as the Earth system scientists plotted, where are we on those planetary boundaries? I wanted to say, where are we on the social foundation? So. That's the social foundation diagram up there in the corner. If everybody had the resources to meet their human rights, that inner circle would go completely orange. Everybody would be out of that space. So for example, on food, you can see there's 13%, that blue strip is the 13% of people in the world who don't have enough food to eat. If you actually look at the world's food supply today, uh, we could meet their need with just 3% of the global food supply that we already have. And then you can understand what that's like in context to knowing that between 30 and 50% of the food we already produce is lost in the, in the production process 
wasted in the supply chain or scraped off plates in our kitchens. So we already have 10 times the amount of food to meet the needs of those who are hungry. I'm not saying that's an easy job, but in terms of material provisioning, we can already do that. And then there's the planetary boundaries diagram, just redrawn by Oxfam, but it, it's all exactly the same information. Um, one question is, well, where is the pressure on the planet coming from if it's not coming from people who are living in poverty? And that's why I've taken that climate change wedge and divided it almost in half, because research recently by Thomas Piketty in Chancel says that just 10% of the world's population are responsible for generating 45% of the world's carbon emissions. It's 10% of people in every continent. I call them the global carbonistas. We probably live among them. But that's where the pressure is coming from. So it's incredibly skewed pressure in terms of producing carbon, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And the nitrogen wedge, I've divided the sustainable nitrogen budget. That grey wedge is a third of it because a report by the European Union calculated that simply producing animal feed to, for the dairy industry to produce meat and dairy products for Europe is using around one third of the world's sustainable nitrogen budget. So it's pretty obvious some of the lifestyle changes that need to take place for us even to begin to come back within these boundaries. But if you take these two together, I think that's a pretty strong indictment of the path of global economic development that we've pursued to date. We've already cracked well over three, now we know four of the planetary boundaries, and we've left many, many millions of our fellow human beings living well below the, fu the fundamental social foundation of those, those poverty needs. So you could see this donut as a 21st century compass. The challenge this century, I believe, is to bring ourselves into that space from both sides at the same time, which is something we've never done before. But what an extraordinary task, what an extraordinary challenge, and what an amazing achievement that would be. If we were to do that, if we were to be the generation that started putting ourselves on track for coming back into that space, well, that would be the achievement of a, of a century, for sure. And to me, this is a, a pretty good definition of what progress would look like. Some people don't like the word progress, I love it. Because to me, that would be extraordinary progress to achieve in the 21st century. So if we take that as a compass, we can start using that at different levels in our lives. You can imagine putting your own lifestyle on that table and asking yourself, how does the way that I eat, travel, shop, bank, volunteer, vote, affect humanity's ability to come into that space? How are my personal choices? But we all know our personal choices are constrained by the societies that we live in. What if the G20 finance ministers, these are the G25 finance ministers meeting in uh, St. Petersburg, what if they met around that table? No, they didn't actually meet around that table. <laughs> but what if they did? And why the hell don't they? Because if they're trying to design a global financial system, shouldn't they fundamentally be asking themselves, what would it be like, what would it take to create a global financial system that was in support, in service to the real economy, which itself was in service to life? And having that kind of paradigm in front of them, I believe, would transform the thinking. Because what we look at really shapes the way we think. The G20 finance ministers might not yet be sitting around that table, but we can tell, as Sarah just said, that the, the General Assembly at the United Nations is thinking much closer, and the world's governments are coming much closer, because these 17 Sustainable Development Goals that were agreed in September do cover, actually, every one of the dimensions in that donut. And even though the environmental ones are pretty much condensed into these three, if you dig down inside them and look enough, you can see all of the nine planetary boundaries somehow represented. And the icon they've drawn is quite familiar. Um, a nice donut shape. I'm actually told by people who are inside of the negotiations that when the co-chairs of the Sustainable Development Goals were trying to crunch down the final text and get rid of those commas and brackets, that there was a picture of the donut on the table and people were saying, come on, in all of this angst about brackets and commas, let's keep an eye on the big picture of where we're trying to get to. And if that's true, I'm, I'm told it is, that's an extremely flattering and satisfying thought that that's what our work collectively has helped to influence, to keep it there, the big picture of where these negotiations were going. What if every company in the world had this as its negotiation table, its strategy table, and sat down around this table, put its product in the middle of the table and asked itself, is our brand a donut brand? 
is the way that we are running our business, our core business model, helping to bring humanity into this space, respecting people's rights, creating products that bring health and provide food that are equitable, that respect planetary boundaries, or actually are we currently making a killing and making a great profit, inadvertently or intentionally pushing humanity out of this space? And that's a fundamental question. And I've seen a lot of companies responding to this, and I just want to briefly look at four different ways, I think, that companies and countries and individuals can respond to this concept of planetary and social boundaries. So four responses when you meet that concept. The first one is the most common one. Well, it's nice, but I'm doing business. You do nothing. Just carry on, because the short-term business model's doing great, and it's worked till now. The second response I see quite often is what I call the fair shares approach. Okay, I hear that we need to cut global carbon emissions by about 80%, so what's my share of that? Do I need to cut my emissions by 80%? Some large corporations, almost, I've, I've heard speaking on this, almost see themselves as if countries, we should have a stake in what's our national share. And we've all seen the world's governments haggling for the last 20 years over what's my fair share of that carbon budget. And we know that things don't go well when humans haggle, you know, trying to settle a restaurant bill and no one's actually got the whole thing. It never quite adds up. When humans haggle over a scarce resource, we push ourselves over limits. It's not a good way to go. On the social side, okay, what's the minimum we have to do? What have well, we got to tick off to be sort of, you know, not out of sync? The third level, when we're starting to get somewhere good, I call it the do-no-harm approach. So, actually, we're not just going to haggle for a, a share of... Do, do destructive practices just to cling on to that, but we're actually going to do no harm. We're going to have net zero emissions. We're going to be carbon neutral. We're going to, have, not going to pay not just the minimum wage, but a living wage. We're going to make sure there are no workplace accidents. So we're having no harm. We're having no damaging effect on this donut. But then the level that we aspire to, that very few have got to, but some are starting to look towards, is what I call being generous, or rather being generative, what would it look like, not just to do no harm, but to actively be a company or a country that's bringing humanity into that space? So some of the most exciting generative design is coming from uh, architecture and landscape design. The biomimicry thought leader, Janine Benyus, is talking about generous cities. What would it be like to design a city that actually provided the same ecosystem functions as the local nearby native ecosystem? So it filtered water and collected rainwater just as it did. It sequesters carbon, it produces oxygen, just as the local ecosystem does. And so it's generating, bringing humanity back into being a full participant into these natural cycles. What would it mean to generate social value? Say, let's create intellectual... When, when we create a new design or come up with a new insight, not put it in intellectual property so that we can maximise from our receipts on that, but put it in the commons and make it part of the collective commons the creative commons. So those are the four approaches, and really you can say we're going on a journey from degenerative economics, where we're trapped in a model, because it never talked about these problems in the first place, we're trapped in a model which is degenerative by design, and we'll just do a little bit less bad. We'll be a little bit less bad, we'll minimise our bad, we'll be really efficient, so we're not really very bad at all. But it's still inherently a degenerative design. As the designer William McDonough says, being less bad isn't good, it's just less bad. Let's break through that sustainability, that neutrality of sustainability. Let's break through into regenerative. How can I be good? How can I contribute health, income, gender equity as part of my core business model? How can I contribute more energy than I use? How can I design products that start doing these things? How do I build buildings and cities that do that? To me, that's the very exciting future. And of course, this is a journey. So many companies or countries or communities that are along the journey, the question is not where are you, but where are you going? And let's hope we're going up. So to me, that's the exciting thing of throwing away this old economic diagram and replacing it with a new paradigm. My personal journey has taken me back to eco economics, so I now call myself an economist again, because I want to reclaim that word. It's household management, and what else could we desperately be needing but really wise household management? So I'm asking, donut economics, if that's the goal, what kind of economy would bring us into the donut? And I'm looking at seven ways that I believe are seven core shifts in our thinking. I'm writing a book about that at the moment. I'll come back and tell you those seven ways next year. But uh, thank you very much, and I really look forward to hearing what others have to say this morning. Thank you.